Um, now, friends, this is an exciting Sunday. We're beginning our series on Advent, and which is the season of the Christian liturgical year uh, observed by believers all around the world as a time for waiting and preparing for both the celebration of Christ's first coming and the hopeful expectation of his second coming. Now, people often ask, why do we sing, and, uh, sing songs and talk about waiting for Christ's first coming when it already happened? Here he came 2,000 years ago. He, he, he died and re was resurrected. So why do we still celebrate this? Well, it's because uh, by setting our hearts on celebrating and remembering Christ's first coming, we're also being discipled to anticipate and to look forward to his second coming. We read the passages and hear the biblical stories of how believers thousands of years ago look forward to Christ's first coming. And we ask ourselves, do we have the same hope, the singular focus and anticipation for Christ's second coming? That's why we do this. That's why we celebrate this every year, because just as it was central to the faith of the believers of old, it ought to be central to our faith as well. It's kind of like this. Um, as many of us already know, something incredible happened this week. I mean, for, for far too long, people have wondered how will the story continue and how will it all end? People have dreamed up fancy dreams. Um, they speculated elaborate theories and anticipated greatness like we've never seen before. And what we know so far about this is that, well, it, this can't be the complete picture. There's too many loose ends. The forces of darkness cannot have the last say. A hero must rise and make, things, make all things right once more. And so my Facebook feed started exploding, and the news that many of us have been waiting for for years was finally announced this week. The new Spider-Man movie tickets went on sale. <laughs> Similarly, with even more enthusiasm, anticipation, and hope, and expectation, I mean, our excitement is directed towards Christ, the even greater hero, the true savior, as we have gathered as a church during Advent season to ponder on and look forward to the return of our Lord Jesus. Now let's uh, turn together to John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. And so I'm going to read from verse 1 to, seven, 1 to 8, and we're going to take a pause from there. So let's start from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, in Christian theology, we refer to the first coming of Christ with a fancy word called uh, the incarnation, which literally just means to embody in the flesh. The incarnation then is inescapably tangible. It's, come, it's God coming to our world to be perceptible by the senses. And so when the Apostle John tells us here that the word was God, it's referring to Jesus, as you can probably infer from this. And we're told that the word was God, but also distinguished from God because he was with God. So now you're starting to get this Trinitarian language. But the concept of the word at the same time was a very technical term here. It was a philosophical idea in the Mediterranean world, in the ancient Mediterranean world. And the original word, Logos refers to the unifying creative force in the universe. Again, the original word in Greek, logos, refers to the unifying creative force in the universe. But John, when he wrote this, had, had in mind more than just secular philosophy when he was using this word logos to describe Jesus. First, John reminds us that Jesus was there from the beginning when God created the world, just as the world was made through him, and without him was not anything that was made, as it says in verse 3. In Genesis 1, when God created the world through speaking, Jesus was the word through whom God made the world when he spoke. In other words, everything was made through Jesus, 
And without Jesus, nothing would exist. He is the creative source of not just human lives, but of the entire created world. So when we talk about Jesus's mission to save the world, we must remember that sin corrupted not just human beings, but all of creation. And so Jesus came then to save not just souls, but everything in the world that was created through him. Again, we go back to one of the core values of our church. The cosmic implications of the gospel is a necessary outworking of the logos. And so all of our discussion about Christmas must start there. Why Jesus came to earth and what he came to accomplish is rooted in who Jesus is as the logos. He came to save souls and to redeem the cosmos. Verse 9 through 14. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will or of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as his only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, I would love to spend hours upon hours explaining what this all means. But for the sake of time and for your sanity, I'm going to focus on verse 14. And the word became flesh. Now, there's a, a book called the Gospel of Judas that was discovered several decades ago. Scholars have dated it to several centuries after Jesus' first coming. And when you talk to skeptics on the streets, they'll always mention this gospel as one of the reasons why the Bible uh, that we have is um, made up or, or people took out what they wanted to take out and put in whatever they wanted out of political reasons. I mean, all of that is just isn't true, but pretty much uh, practically no theologian takes this book seriously because of how bizarre and inconsistent with the rest of the Bible um, it portrays Jesus. And we also know because of how late it was written, the consensus is that Judas couldn't have written this. From everything we can tell, it was probably written by an ancient cult of some type, of some type as an attempt to legitimize their beliefs. And, but whatever the case, this, quote, gospel tells us about a Jesus that's completely different from the God, Jesus that we know. This Jesus is not material at all. He is entirely spiritual. He wasn't born into an earthly body, but came down from heaven as a spirit. In fact, in the gospel of Judas, this Jesus like teleports from place to place as a spirit all throughout his life on earth. He doesn't use his legs very much. And the effect of all of this is that when you read this Jesus, this Jesus remains cold, distant, unrelatable, and not entirely human. I was reading again just to make sure, and this Jesus laughs at his disciples all the time for their ignorance. If Jesus was not incarnate into a human body, how can he truly understand the, the depths of our, our pain, our, our confusion, our hunger, our body aches, our diseases, and, and our mental health issues? that come with a physical body, corrupted by sin and its consequences. In the gospel of Jesus, Jesus does not, and he cannot relate. This is why it's not by accident that Jesus came to earth in human form. The incarnation is incredibly intimate. The Christmas story reminds us that God came near to humanity by becoming one of us. And as a result, we can identify with God by identifying with that human form in the person of Christ. The enormous gap between the divine and the creature is bridged through the incarnation of Christ. This is why it's so natural for Christians all around the world to create nativity scenes with images of Christ in their own respective skin colors. Is it historically accurate? No. But that's not the point. The point is to contextualize Jesus to help others relate to him more and to also communicate the fact without words that Jesus relates to us. And so it's, 
and here's where our cultural assumptions about Jesus' incarnation still embody white supremacy. It might require further repentance. Now, as a person of color, if you've ever seen pictures of statues of baby Jesus that's black, brown, or yellow, or Asian, and felt a, a sort of like discomfort, embarrassment, or dissonance that you would not feel if you saw the same picture or statue of baby Jesus with smooth white skin, then we need to repent. Now, I remember seeing paintings of Korean Jesus many years ago and feeling embarrassed by all the comments on the, the internet toilet that we called Reddit. I, I was going through a season of, well, rather, I, I, I came to America and developed this sense of self-hatred. I was embarrassed to be Asian. I, I was embarrassed by my culture, by the way we spoke and how we, were, how we sounded to English-speaking Americans. I was embarrassed by my, our foods and the smell of our foods. And, and so when I saw Korean Jesus, I thought, oh my goodness, this is the worst. But as I've gotten older and studied these paintings, they become very precious to me and I've had to repent. Now there's a, there's a death a uh, Korean Christian painter named uh, Kim Ki Chang. Uh, he, with Kim Ki Chang, um, he painted his interpretation of the Gospels during the Korean War. And he said of these paintings, I was praying for the quick end of the Korean War and a unified peace and soothed my painful mind with the paintbrush. And here's his take of the incarnation. It's a farm, or it's like a barn in, in, in Korea with people that look Korean in Korean clothing. How does this make you feel? Awkward, cringy, or oh, scared that it's unbiblical or relatable? Or how about this one by another artist? Or on this one. These paintings from all across the world represent what the incarnation is about. The word became flesh to relate to us in our humanity. In our brokenness, in our weakness. Christ came in the form of the most vulnerable, a baby. Born in a manger. Born to a family of carpenters. When, when verse 14 tells us the word dwelt among us, the Greek word to dwell is uh, the same root word uh, for the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for tabernacle. So again, think to dwell, tabernacle, which was a traveling temple in the form of a tent that the Israelites used to worship in when they were traveling through the wilderness after uh, being freed from slavery in Egypt. The tabernacle then, uh, was essentially like the beta rendition of God's house on earth before they built the physical temple building. Jesus then was tabernacling with us when he came through the incarnation. What does this mean? What is this telling us? You now, my friend, the former uh, lead pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church's Eastside Campus, Abe Cho, he put it this way. He said, in an essay written by C.S. Lewis, he invites us, Lewis invites us to imagine stepping into a dark tool shed on a bright summer day. As the door closes behind you, you find yourself in darkness except for a single beam of light shining from a crack in the roof. With its specks of floating dust, it's, most striking, uh, it's the most striking thing you see. But as you move toward it, your eyes move up along its length, and at some point, you realize you aren't looking at a beam of light anymore. You're looking along the light. And at that moment, the entire previous picture instantly changes. Suddenly, you see a whole other world, leaves glowing green, lit up by the summer sun. The message of Advent is not just that we are caught in a dark shed and a beam of hope has broken through, though that is true, the message is that if you would step into that beam, you'd see there is an entire world of grace that is coming. 
and has begun to break decisively into our darkness in the birth of Christ. The hope of Advent is not salvation of our souls out of this world. It, it is the coming of an entirely new world in the reign of Christ. In other words, there's a great difference in the fact that Jesus didn't come to earth to snatch us back up to heaven and leave this world rotting and decaying and broken. The fact that he came to tabernacle with us points to a residential permanence. He's going to call this place his home, and we're invited to dwell in it with him. He came to inaugurate an entirely new world, a new kingdom, where he reigns as king on this same earth, and where we'll join him as co-heirs of that kingdom. This is why he came to earth. This is why the word became flesh and not just came temporarily as a spirit then went right back up. He came as flesh and tabernacled among us. His incarnation initiated all of this. His death and resurrection of the cross inaugurated it and his second coming will consummate it. Thank God for sending us Jesus. Thank God for our Savior who died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and enter into our new home as God's children, as John tells us. Thank God for the resurrected king who reigns and expands his kingdom now through his children as we seek to redeem all things. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you may just set our sights now upon Christ, upon his first coming, upon the purpose of his coming, which was first to come in the flesh and relate to us in our weakness and our brokenness and our humanity and all that it, in all that it entails through our race, our ethnicity, our culture, through our occupation through our gender, whatever it may be, Lord, that you came to relate to us in our weakness, in our sin, in our oppression, in our addictions, whatever it may be, Lord, you have come here to show us that there is freedom and forgiveness for you. So help us, Lord, to now believe in the gospel once more, to cherish it, to, to let it transform us as we're reminded once more of our identity, as children of, of your family so that we can join you in expanding this kingdom that you've come to establish, this kingdom on this earth that we're called to steward well in your name. Help us, Lord, to become a church that's focused not just on the salvation of souls, but on the redemption of the cosmos, of everything that is in this world as it was all created through your son. So we thank you for the Christmas story. We thank you that we can be reminded once more the gospel and why you came to earth and what you will come back to finish. In Jesus' name we pray.